Good morning, everybody. Morning. 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 Good morning, morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, today to talk about our home oxygen service, smoking and fire safety. Just to make you aware from the beginning, we are recording this webinar and that's to enable those that can't attend today to um, be able to see it on the portal download section in the future. So if you've got any objections to the recording, please leave. But apart from that, just um, you can sit back and relax uh, the presentations that are coming your way. People may join as we carry on. So you might hear the slight bing bing of the doorbell. Um, but I think quite a majority are present. So we will make a start because we have 90 minutes and I'm sure you've all got patience and work that you need to get on to um, as soon as possible. So with the meeting guidelines, um, just to highlight to you some sort of courtesy within the meeting to if you've got any questions and I'm sure you all will have at certain points, please can you submit your questions through uh, the button on the screen? So the oh, okay. comments oh, wow. and that's where you can put your questions in and we will pick them up and answer them um, at certain points through the webinar. Also, please, can you all keep your microphones muted? It just helps with echo sound and um, people hearing the audio as best it can do. Um, it's up to you if you want to have your camera on. It's lovely to see your faces, uh, but that's your choice as well. So as I said, the session is being recorded and it will be made available on the portal, I think hopefully by tomorrow or by the end of the week. But Claire will correct me later if that's different. Who have you got today talking to you? Well, you've got myself, Claire Murphy. I'm the clinical lead for BOC covering UK and Ireland, HOS regions, alongside uh, clinical services where we deliver HOS AR, pulmonary rehab and cardiac rehab up and down the country. I now hand over to Dr Booth to introduce himself. Dr Booth? I can. Are you there, Dr. Booth? He appears to have dropped off, Claire. He's no longer, so he must have lost connection. OK, I'll introduce Dr. Booth. We're really lucky, actually, while um, he's not here. Um, it's it, Most of you are probably thinking that uh, we've got a GP coming to talk to us about oxygen. Well, Dr. Booth is a bit of an exception um, and he was he amazed me with a really complicated case that we dealt mm. with. Um, back in 2020 and due to his actions, um, etc. I wanted him to come and speak to the wider audience to present a case study. Um, so Dr. Booth will be presenting his case study shortly and then handing over um, James Phillips. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, I'm James Phillips. I'm um, BOC operations manager for the East of England. Thank you, James. And then we've also got Paul and Kieran. Um, I think, are they here? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm here. So um, I'm Kieran. I'm the Live Safe Manager, looking after domestic fire safety for um, Essex Fire and Rescue Service. And Paul should also be here as well. Yeah, I'm also here. Good morning, everybody. I'm the Impairment Disability Officer for Essex County Fire and Rescue Service. Thank you very much, guys. So we're really lucky to have the fire service supporting us with the talk they're giving at the end of the webinar today. So moving on. The agenda today is um, what we're going to talk about is managing the series. So we had a very complex case, as I've mentioned, to do with a patient with a disassociative identity disorder. That's what we're going to concentrate on first. We're then going to look at um, smoking policy. Uh, what's coming our way in the east of England and also the benefits of smoke and cessation. So that's looking really at internally what steps are BOC taking to help with the crusade here. James Phillips will then introduce um, a presentation on e-cigarettes and the dangers for HOS patients. And that's really interesting because we know that um, e-cigarettes 
um, are seen as quite a positive step down from smoking and part of smoking cessation, but there's lots of safety issues that we need to be aware of. And then we'll move on to the fire service um, to really talk about collaboration and um, what they're doing locally with us. Sorry, my slides took a life of their own there. But number one, so to start with, um, I wanted to show you how do we compare in the UK compared to a more global approach with home oxygen safety. But what we can see here on the slides is in America, so in the US, they've got 1.5 million patients on home oxygen. In Japan, they've got 160,000. And England, we've got roughly 81,000 patients on home oxygen therapy. Now, if we break it down to fire fatalities in the US, they have around 100 cases of fire fatalities every year. Japan average five and in England we average um, 0.28. Now, why do we average so? Um, You're still showing screen two on our on our presentation on our screens. Oh, sorry. That's all right. Thank you. Let me just restart. That's probably where it went a bit crazy. Take it, would you like to resume? Resume. I love technology, not. <laughs> That's it, you're on screen five now we can see. Lovely, lovely. So you can, can you see the countries? You can see the statistics there? Yeah. Yeah, so we've got, yeah. um, you know, we've got England at 0.28 and we can be really proud of that. Why is that the case? Well, it's because actually uh, we've got really good Jose R services. We do risk assessments, don't we? So us as providers and other providers do lots of risk assessments to try and bring down the risk of um, any safety issues there. We also provide education to our patients as technicians or clinicians to remind them about the dangers of having oxygen, you know, cooking or, you know, smoking. There's a lot of awareness as well. And we also introduced the fire break. So the fire break is used, um, you know, up and down the country now as, can you still see my slide? Because it's flipped again. You're on screen five. Yeah, that's fine. Faye, you're my go-to, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we also use the fire break and that's brought down the risk further as well. I'm really proud to say that we've had some really um, healthy MDT discussions um, alongside. So where there is a patient situation and there's a risk, but they need oxygen, we get all of the heads around the table to see actually what can we do here to uh, bring down the risk further. And it's a healthy collaborative discussion. But I will point out that although it says 0.28, um, that does that. That's for those on the death certificate, where it's you know it highlights that the fire has been the number one cause of their death. So what about when we've got burns? What about when there's smoke inhalation? What about if that initial burn led them to go into hospital, get a hospital acquired pneumonia, and then there was a deterioration? So where is it on the list, the coroner's certificate, of the cause of death? So that is the tip of the iceberg. So. It is healthy, it is looking good, but I'm suggesting that we aren't capturing uh, the full picture that's out there. So that's just kind of a little snapshot for you of where we stand across the world there. Um, and I can't move that forward now. Let me just try again. So now what I would like to do is move on to our Siri and our case study. Uh, our case study here. So uh, let me see where I am. This is our patient with disassociative identity disorder and Dr. Booth um, will be handing, I'll be handing over to him in just a second here. First of all, I want to go through the Siri. Most of you will be familiar with um, seeing a Siri. I might share a Siri with you and this is a serious incident requiring investigation. So up and down the country this is what we do when there's a concern. We raise it as a Siri, we um, apply a grade into it and it is what you would find in the NHS as well and in the future we'll be looking at the initial grading 
and then what the grading changes to. Does it go up or down following investigation? But in this example, I just want to present to you on the 24th of October last year, there was a fire. So the patient woke up and saw the tube on fire. The fire had spread to the trousers and shoes and the brother put out the fire and called an ambulance. The patient was then taken to hospital with facial burns um, and had no idea what, what caused the fire, what caused the ignition even. In his room, he had a TV and he had air conditioning on. And the patient said that no one in the property had smoked. So that happened on the 24th. Two days later, the patient contacted us and said, actually, can you come and replace the tube in to the concentrator? Um, and because there was a fire, so he mentioned that there was a fire there. So our ears pricked up and our alarm bell started to ring and we raised a Siri. We alerted the fire service and we attended the property. Now in the property, we could find no sign of smoking. Um, there was a lighter, a toaster, a microwave and an oven in the patient's bedroom. Um, with um, us delivering further safety education. Now, it's important to note the patient was on high flows of oxygen. So this fire had happened with the patient receiving 12 litres a minute of oxygen. So we had a two day delay of it being reported to us and then we put the wheels in motion. So we delivered education. We attended same day, delivered education and felt there was no smoking at the property. We then did a follow up to visit two days later and the patient reports that he's a, definitely a non smoker, but he starts to talk to the technician as often they will open up to our technicians and he reported an alter ego. So the alter ego, the patient said, had tried to kill him. The technician then escalates this to myself. And I then um, escalate this to Dr. Booth, who's the patient's GP, the specialist respiratory nurses. Uh, we've got the fire service involved and an urgent MDT, a request is needed. And at this point in time, I'm seeing lots and lots of risk and alarm and I'm needing the oxygen to come out. That's my number one priority. The GP visits the patient, Dr. Booth is this is. And the patient was admitted to hospital. So the patient was poorly at home and it needed to be readmitted for his burns. Dr. Booth submitted a removal hoof. Um, and whilst the patient was in hospital, they were starting to plan for his discharge. And we were saying, can we halt and let's have an MDT before we proceed anywhere moving forward? Now I'd like to hand over to Dr. Booth to present his case study on this. So thank you very much for inviting me to join your meeting today. Um, this was a, um, a, a really interesting um, case study. And um, as I've discovered in my 15 years as a GP, you can always be surprised further by your patients. Um, and that was certainly the case um, with this chap. So um, it was a really, um, it was an unusual circumstance um, with a lot of implications of patient safety. Um, and I've also just had a few learning points in here and and actually it turned out to be a really good example of team working with colleagues that I'd previously been unaware of, um, which I felt I probably shouldn't have been. So PB um, is a 56 year old man with lots of illnesses. He's um, I've looked after him for some years now. Um, the main issue is that he's got um, severe COPD with type 2 respiratory failure. Um, so that's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is from a very long standing smoking habit, which he's now finished. He's also got ischemic heart disease. He's a type two diabetic and he's got a significant mental health history. He's had problems with very severe depression in the past. And it's been quite a complicated history in terms of his mental health, although that's been much more settled in recent years. Um, he's pretty much housebound. He's dependent on a motorized wheelchair to get out. Um, and is dependent on his home oxygen supply. Um, he desaturates and becomes unwell very quickly if he's off oxygen. Um, he lives in supported accommodation with his brother, um, who also has very significant mental health issues. In fact, his brother has 
very severe um, um, problems with depression and has in fact been um, suicidal quite frequently in the past. And his brother's um, very frail elderly mother-in-law also lives in the house and does some sort of ad hoc care in this slightly strange menage a trois that three of them have set up. Um, so as, um, as Claire said, on the 24th of October, he's admitted to our local hospital with facial burns um, following a fire in his room and his oxygen tubing and um, clothing have caught fire. Now, he's initially unable to account for the cause of the fire, which is what our discharge summary says. And in fact, I have to say, when I read it, my first instinct was he hasn't quit smoking and he has just hasn't told us, um, which seemed to be the most likely thing. You know, he's had decided just to have a cheeky bag. Um, but as to the technician um, and whilst an inpatient as well, when he's admitted, he says that I believe myself to have a split personality. Um, his split personality has a name, and my split personality, who he calls Edward, has set the fire in an attempt to kill him. He's tried to kill me before, he says, and he absolutely adamantly denies smoking and any unsafe actions around his oxygen were not under the effect of his personality, and very clearly talks as this as being a separate identity that he, that he has. You know, I'm, he's done this before. It, it was Edward, not me. This, this is what happens, you know. Um, and rather alarmingly, he then gets discharged home despite this after just a few days with some mental health follow up planned in the community, but nothing definite. No detailed safety assessment or plan around his home oxygen from the hospital at all. Um, and so, as it goes on the 30th of um, October, I speak to Claire, who has says they are we're taking his oxygen away, which I absolutely agree is appropriate. Um, now he's oxygen dependent so he has to be readmitted um in fact he is also struggling quite a lot with pain control from burns but his house is generally one that um, is in quite a high state of disorder and neglect at times um there's a general air of somebody not really coping brilliantly but the prime reason for getting him in actually really is going to be the fact that he's not going to cope without his oxygen um what I then get, and this, this ties into some of the conversations we had later, I also then get a, a phone call from the palliative care counsellor he sees, so hospice, wanting to know why Dr. Booth has given him an ultimatum, as she puts it, that he has to go into hospital. And so having to explain the situation quite, quite carefully, but clearly it's being sold to other people as, you know, this is, this is unfair, this is, this, this is somebody not treating him right. Um, this poor man doesn't want to go into hospital and, and so forth. Um, so while he's in hospital, he expresses an awful lot of dissent to being in there. He doesn't want to be in hospital at all and is um, complaining bitterly to everyone around him that he's an impatient. Um, now, multiple teams get involved with him and what becomes really clear is there's lots of different professional points of view. So for example, the palliative care nurse and palliative care social worker who see him, who oh, I've just lost my slides, hang on. Um, they are very keen to highlight a lot of the sort of expressed emotion around this. He would rather go home without oxygen than go to a care home. Well, in fact, he can't go home without oxygen. He'd end up being readmitted very quickly if he didn't have any oxygen at home because he, he wouldn't be able to cope without it. Um, and actually quite a lot of um, yeah, a, a general sense that other professionals being difficult here. He wants to go home. This is the patient's wish. He has capacity. Um, so the mental health team come and see him on the ward and actually do a very detailed assessment and confirm that he does have a dissociative personality disorder. And in fact, he discloses that he's been having these episodes since his teens, um, when he had some very dark and difficult times in his childhood, and has never really told anybody about it, but he's very aware that he has this other personality. And the mental health team think actually genuinely he does, he does have this, because I think there's still been the thought at the back of some people's minds that maybe this was uh, a story that had emerged to cover up something more accidental, you know, but they're, they're happy this is his diagnosis. And so we have this very significant conflict between, on the one hand, his very deeply held wish to return home. He doesn't like being in hospital and he 
believes that he has capacity, which he does to say, I want to go home. And the fact that he needs to have home oxygen to be able to cope there. And there's a lot of uncertainty over the safety around this with lots of differing views about how that safety should be managed. And so the team sort of devolved into lots of people pushing for his discharge and lots of issues from BOC rightly about the liability issues in the event of him being discharged and a general sense that there are probably people in the team who don't really get what this liability would be in the event of harm happening to him or happening to others if this incident happens again. Um, so we have our first MDT um, on the 2nd of December. So as you can see, this is taking a long time to sort out. He's, the initial incident was in October, so he's been in hospital for a while at this point. So he's, there's um, a patient advocate for him at the meeting, which I think is important, and lots of good input, actually. Um, so the fire service are present, um, social care, the ner ward nursing team are present. And it's a really challenging discussion. It's one of the more challenging MDTs I've been at with a lot of, a lot of tension between um, the safety issues on one hand and the emotional well-being of the patient. And um, some of the measures proposed by the patient, which worryingly, to my mind, some members of the MDT were, were very supportive of, included his family tying him to a chair at night so he couldn't get up, so therefore he couldn't start a fire. Um, there were talks about him having an alarm in the house that and a, a sort of sense of this sort of unnecessary, this really sort of unwarranted optimism that his family could keep him safe, even though his family themselves were vulnerable. He lived with two other vulnerable adults. Um, and there'd also been worryingly some misconceptions. So the fire service um, had, were expressing that we don't believe this man to be safe at home. In fact, the inpatient team had, written, had put in writing that the fire service had been happy that he could go. And there had to be, I certainly felt my job at that meeting sort of turned into saying, you know, this is a, a very serious risk. We're not doing this to be unfair to him. We're not doing, we're not, this isn't a decision being made, made on the basis of emotion. It's being made on a very, very genuine safety risk that we don't think is being managed um, properly to date. And we can't, he can't go, he can go home if he chooses. But if he goes home, he'll go home without oxygen, with all that means, because there is no way this is currently deemed to be safe. And I think there was a, a very real sense that um, the safety risks that this situation presented weren't being understood, especially surprising, given that we weren't talking about a theoretical risk of fire. It had already happened. He was in hospital because he burnt himself. Um, we knew that this was a situation where fires were going to happen because it already had. So um, it was it was a very it was a very challenging meeting and actually um, Claire's support at that meeting was absolutely invaluable. And and I think had we not had that input, I don't think we'd have had the outcome that we um, that we had. Um, so we had a follow up MDT after we all decided to go away and think about it. Um, this is much better. Um, he's got now a very detailed risk assessment. Um, he's got a care package put in place and some mental health follow-up arranged. And most importantly, he's got overnight care now. So um, the overnight carers are aware of the issues around him and there is somebody, there's a responsible adult in the home at night. Initially, this was planned to be for his initial post-discharge period um, and with a review a bit further down the line to see how he was getting on. In fact, it's still in place. Um, we discussed um, this patient at our practice um, frailty meeting just this week and there's now beginning to be the debate again about what happens about this overnight care package and I have to say I still don't think he's going to be um, completely safe without it which is going to obviously pose issues going forward with how this gets paid for and so on um, but we have had no further incidents he's got a good robust support package in place um, we see him fairly regularly about his other um, very significant health conditions and whilst the house remains quite quite cluttered there's certainly no evidence of any smoking in there um, and there haven't been any further mishaps with his oxygen and um, I think unfortunately he now has a degree of mistrust around us as professionals which is a shame I, I can see how it's happened 
but we've tried to be very clear that the decisions we've taken were taken for the reasons you know to keep him and his family safe which i i think he accepts um we've had a bit of a struggle getting some detailed mental health follow-up for him um our mental health services like everywhere are rather stretched and um I think we have, I'm not completely happy that the, the personality issues have been completely sort of safely assessed and managed, but we're keeping a close eye on him. Um, he does still have that community follow up. And so far, things have been safe sort of nine, 10 months on. Um, so the learning points for me were um, firstly, the absolute importance of teamwork on this. Um, no one of us held the answers to sort this situation out. And clear communication was absolutely vital. And in fact, the situation only really started to improve once we started to have those detailed MDTs. And we actually we had all the professionals in the same room to correct some of the misconceptions that were sort of, there was a bit of Chinese whispers about some things. And actually having everyone in the, in the room at the same time, or on, on teams at the same time, as it turned out, um, was absolutely vital. And I think... Um, the unexpected levels of conflict between patient advocacy and these, this absolute empirical fire safety risk was a surprise. And there was, it was surprising how hard we had to work to get past that. Um, I think there was, there's a learning point about the differing levels of understanding of by professional teams as the extent of that risk. Um, and the difference between trusting optimism and respectful skepticism, um, which in my, my one of my other roles is I'm the child safeguarding GP for Mid Essex, and it's one of the things we bring out in child protection training. This idea that respectful scepticism is sometimes the right approach, whereas it's drilled into us as health professionals that trusting optimism is the right way. And I think there was a sense of taking his assurances that he'd be fine without really any evidence for that was a bit of a thing. Um, so the need for representation from all teams, we all of us had information and advice that was unique to us to share. And it was very important that he had that advocacy from the teams who had differing views, because that, that's an important part of the process around any patient. Um, the time scale of these arrangements was significant. It took us a long while to get this sorted out, and that in itself increased patient risk. Um, he was an inpatient during COVID, and one of the issues around him being in hospital, and he never liked being in hospital, but the fact that he was in hospital during the COVID pandemic with his respiratory conditions and his frailty was, was a very great concern to him and genuinely a risk. He was, he's, he's a patient who would not have done well had he contracted um, COVID-19, although mercifully he didn't. Um, and we've also had um, one failed discharge because the planning wasn't in place and we only narrowly avoided a second failed discharge as well for him. And that has an implication on hospital resource, hospital time, ambulance service resource. But it was a really good example of team working. Um, and I think we did prevent a potentially very dangerous situation. Um, it was a really good wide buy into the MDT, which we don't normally see in MDTs in my experience. And that was hugely helpful. And I'd also been completely unaware about the um, advisories, the clinical advisory resource that VOC had. Um, I'd been very used to filling out who forms for years, but I hadn't realized just how much of a structure that BOC had behind that. Um, that was absolutely invaluable and something that um, I'm very much going to bear in mind in future because um, it's always nice to know where you've got advice to come from in my job and knowing that there's a, a system um, here is going to be something I suspect will be very useful in the future as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Booth. That was that was really interesting. Can I ask, are there any questions anyone would like to raise and ask if you put your hand up. I have to say that um, I echo everything that Dr Booth said there. It was a really, really uh, challenging um, case to deal with. There was lots of emotional um, talk as well that needed to be separated from, you know, elements of safety that needed to be um, addressed as paramount. I can't actually see. Claire, can you see who's got the hand up? No, I, I can't see that any hands are up. I've seen the comment from uh, uh, Lewis, thank you, saying that that was uh, a really interesting talk. Sam, um, Sam Alton has got a hand up. 
Hi, yeah. Thanks, Dr. Booth and Claire, for that talk. It was really interesting. I just really wanted to make a comment in that we had a very similar situation a couple of years ago with a patient with significant mental health problems. And I just know how stressful and difficult it is. And certainly our experiences, the challenges that you faced were exactly what we faced as well in terms of um, other professionals not really understanding the risk and as a respiratory team, and I'm sure you felt it as a GP, you know that you're going to carry on caring for that patient after this. Yeah. And that's really difficult because you, you you don't come into this profession to, you know, actually take stuff away from people in that way. And it's very emotive, isn't it? Oxygen as, as a subject anyway. So it, it puts you in a really, really difficult position. Um, and I don't think people truly understand that. They sometimes think you're just digging your heels in, but you're trying to um, keep the safety of everyone paramount, aren't you? Mm. Um, so I just wanted to say well done because I know how stressful and difficult it is. And I think we've got a long way to go to educate all professionals, really, yeah. um, about oxygen isn't just something you prescribe and away you go, that there's a whole responsibility around that, like you would for warfarin prescribing, for example. Well, and it's true. And no one's ever actually taught me formally about home oxygen as a GP. I've just picked stuff up, um, which is I, I think that's probably how most of us have learned stuff is we've just picked stuff up and when I think of some of the more useless things I have been trained on actually an hour on actually how this system works uh, would, would have been very useful at some point I think. I think that's that's for me to make sure that we um, pick that up I have to say that um, it was amazing the the strength that you brought to the conversations there Dr Booth so I, re I really appreciate that but you've got more hands up now so yes. um, we've got uh, Wendy Bradford from East Midlands oh, East as Midlands. the host lead. Uh, as the host lead. Hi good morning um, again I'm just reiterating we've had where I sit in Bassett Law because I'm regionally for East Midlands but my clinical region's Bassett Law and it's the most northern point of the East Midlands and Nottinghamshire. Um, and I border on another light, a grey area with South Yorkshire. Um, and we had a patient in our hospital quite recently that needed oxygen to go home, was smoking. The daughter who lived with her was smoking and she was buying the cigarettes. There were memory problems starting with both the patient and her husband. And it was very, it was very emotive. It was very challenging. And we did... It was full on cross border working. So we actually, the oxygen nurse from uh, Doncaster couldn't get. So she asked me to represent from an oxygen point of view. The medics from the ward were absolutely brilliant. I mean, Chris Knapp, who's the senior reg, he's very passionate about oxygen. And he wasn't going to let this lady go home because, again, she, she needed it, but we needed to make sure it was safe. And it was about making sure that, you know, both the patient and the family understood. You know, she was all for discharging herself. I mean, she tried leaving the meeting, I think, three times. She took her oxygen off and tried wheeling herself out. Um, so it was actually a very, very difficult meeting. Um, the lady eventually, a risk assessment was done before that was agreed, before she went home. There was lots of conversations regarding the daughter stopping smoking because it was felt like if the daughter stopped smoking, interestingly, the mum would stop smoking because she was only getting cigarettes because the daughter was smoking and buying them. So the daughter had to stop smoking as well. But it was a very it was a very long three weeks where we were trying to get all those conversations and all the visits and everything done. And it was actually quite draining. And you know, like the last lady's just said, and the GP just said, you don't people who are not doing oxygen don't understand, you know, the the key elements of what actually underpins safe oxygen prescribing. And like you said, as a GP. None of us actually, I've been in ox doing oxygen now for 10 years, but I never set out to be an oxygen nurse. It was never on my plan to actually, I'm going to train to be an oxygen nurse. And I remember it, it almost is rabbit caught in headlights when anybody starts doing oxygen because there is no career path, there is no training path. And a lot of what you learn is kind of hit the floor running and just see what happens. I think um, you need to bring change, you Wendy. To bring change, Wendy. But 10 years down the line, every day is still a school day something still comes up um you know and i always have conversations regularly with claire and blc about you know well we've got this scenario here i mean patient service and uh, patient call center 
actually just i now phone up as that with battery law again but what you got today and you just can't some of it you just can't make up you really can't make up and it is still i'm 10 years in and still learning so i think it is very difficult it's difficult for us doing it every day it's even more difficult for the generalists that are not doing it every day and it's just a small part of everything that they do so i think we need we all have a responsibility to try and raise the awareness and, ra and raise a profile of oxygen safety and, you know and it has to come regionally nationally it has to sort of hit all those kind of higher levels way beyond just us on this meeting thank you wendy thank you wendy Claire, there was a question, Claire, there was a question submitted on the chat by um, Sasha Lorenzo, and that's who can issue a removal hoof? Um, is that any healthcare professional? Any healthcare professional can issue the removal hoof. What, what I'd like to know is making sure that's tied into the relevant bodies around the patient. So if a GP wants to submit a removal hoof, I would take it that they've had a conversation with the previous prescriber if that, or the oxygen team and it's been agreed that that's the right step forward. It's just making sure that that's taken place and, and documented. Does that answer your question, Sasha? I take it as yes, or you can type in. Claire, what's next? Just mindful of time. Um, well, there's, there's, yeah, I think we're, we're going to have to move on um, in the interest of time. But Jan, Jan Turner-Wilson has submitted a question um, about whether there's a joined up policy or pathway between secondary care uh, and community. Um, I think that's a good question for us to save to Claire when you do this the session about smoking policies, because um, yeah. I, I think that, that would be relevant for then. But um Oh, and Sasha has responded that yes, yeah. that did answer the question. Esther, okay. Esther's got a, her hand up. Esther, have you got a quick question or do you want us to pick yes, this up separately? Um, Go I ahead. A quick one. I wanted to find out where the, you know, with this case of this complex case with this patient with COPD, heart issues, as well as um, um, mental health issues, mm. where does the liability lies? So mm. if this patient has been sent home and uh, uh, it turned out that uh, there was another fire, so who picks up that liability? Well, I would say, and Dr. Booth, I don't know if you're still there to comment here, yeah. everybody who knows about this has some liability. But Dr. Booth, what do you think? Um, so I agree. I mean, I was, there was, I mean, I had to, I made the point at the first MDT that if, if, he, if he went home and there was an accident, then the coroner was going to be looking at the minutes of this MDT. And... Um, it was something that as professionals we all had to bear in mind and I think actually that that sense of liability is it's a team decision um, but I was quite keen to I, I was going to dissent anyway and I had plans I, I was certainly during that first meeting I had plans for how I was going to escalate further if I didn't get my way <laughs> that he stayed in hospital um, but yeah I, I think I agree it's a shared professional liability um and and a very serious one as well because you know the, these things can Im can involve deaths and yeah and i think that's a very important point for all professionals to realize that if you're part of a decision making process your part in that process is open to scrutiny mm. absolutely because um, you don't want to live next door to a patient that <laughs> sets up something and then your house get born you know there's significant consequences yeah. The results of the decision. So, was there some kind of policy or something that was used to make, come to that agreement, or, or was it just a, a decision made by the team? I think I think it was very much it was Dr. Booth and myself saying that how we have to think sensibly and mitigate the risk and driving that agenda forward, cutting through emotion to to try and come for the best outcome to the patient. But we absolutely could not be railroaded into sentiment or whatever to to um, skip through and, and avoid the, the risk that was in front of us. Mm -hmm. Dr Booth, what would you add? I, I agree. I think that was the, the thing is what we were able to, what we kept bringing it back to was categorically there is a risk here that we know about and it's not even a theoretical one. We've done this already. We don't know that it's what we, we there's a very good likelihood this happens again. 
And to be honest, I think we, we use the example of if he goes home and there's a fire now, it's indefensible. We, mm. we, we knew that this happened. You know, we, we hadn't solved it. But I think that's an important thing is that risk doesn't relate to emotion. Risk is an empirical thing. And the fact that someone is upset about that risk doesn't change that risk. Um, and I think getting that across, and I think, I think it is hard because I think healthcare professionals are trained more than ever now to your patient's thoughts and feelings are rightly um, paramount. You know, the, the patient should be at the centre of the decision-making process rightly. But that doesn't change, doesn't change the science of the risk. And the fact that he is really unhappy about being in hospital doesn't make oxygen less flammable. And um, I think that's something that it's really important to, to reinforce. And I think as well, that was where it was so helpful, having another voice. I mean, Claire at the meeting as well, having another really expert voice backing that up. Um, that was, I, I don't think we've had the outcome we got otherwise. All right. Thank, thank you. you very much. <laughs> I think thank we have you. to go on now. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Dr. Booth. Um, lots of interest um, with this case. And um, I spoke to Dr. Booth before the session started. Now, this is a replacement of uh, education events. You know, we normally have new market. So in September, October, you will be uh, swamped with more webinars and education um, until we can go back to our new market type event face to face. So if we want to revisit this, then you can let us know and Dr. Booth's willing to come back and we can explore different avenues. We could also have an update of the case at that time, if that's OK. I like, I like the sound of a day in new market. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> post COVID, we'll go back to that. Yes. <laughs> well, well th thank you all very, very much for having me today as well. It's been a, it's been a really interesting process to be part of. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Booth. Bye -bye. OK, thank you. Um, moving on now with um, the topic of the, these high risk and smoking. So up in smoke, BOC's perspective, and I just want to mention the benefits of smoke and policy being in place for home oxygen. Um, these are the headlines that um, we hear daily internally from our technicians delivering oxygen. So um, they smell smoke in the patient's home. They might see a, light, a lighter on a patient's bed when they're installing oxygen, or they might see a lighter in the on the sofa. They see an ashtray fall near the patient's uh, bedroom or in the lounge. There could be that stench, couldn't there, that the yellow stained curtains, the walls, just smoke and environment. And then sadly, in the last eight weeks, we've had three patients who have admitted and been found to smoke on oxygen, but smoking heroin as well. And when these cases have been um, escalated to me, in my head, I've thought, well, the, are these younger patients who've been diagnosed and that's why they're on oxygen? But these are older patients. So they've all been males over 60 years old who habitually continue to smoke heroin daily with their oxygen. And then we've got uh, the other end of the drug spectrum with patients smoking cannabis as well. It is ever present and, and, and day in, day out is something we deal with. So I'm really, really pleased and excited to announce what the East of England are doing to manage this. Currently, each CCG I have uh, are at different stages with their policies. Now, these policies are setting out the rules for if a patient smokes when they can get oxygen therapy. So what it should, what they're automatically say is if you've got a smoking patient in clinic, then they cannot have oxygen until they've done X, Y, Z. So um, for some of your regions, they will be close to being released. In other regions, they're going through draft stages, but I'm hoping that by this time next year, we may be a region that has a smoking policy fit for purpose across the board and that these dangers and risks are completely mitigate, mitigated and we no longer have the amount of series that we, we have at present. Um, I've just looked at some factors, though, that um, I'm hoping that they include. I know some clinicians, um, Janice from Essex, 
helped create the policy. So where you are involved in any creation of the policies, um, you may have factored these points in because I haven't visually seen them yet. So uh, the questions I would think of are, what do we do with our historical smokers who are actually safe, where they uh, come off the oxygen for 20 minutes and then light up a cigarette? What do we do with those um, promise to stop smokers, um, new patients on oxygen who then start smoking, palliative patients. This is another area where it can become very emotive. You know, the patient is end of life, bed bound. That's their last prep pleasure. They're on an air mattress. The rules need to be clear there as well. What is also the definition of when a patient stops smoking? Is it six weeks? Um, is it that they've done smoking cessation they're on that pathway is it eight weeks smoke free does that include any hospital stay I've had a case where the patient was admitted for four weeks so they said actually they've been four weeks clear but is that a really artificial environment um, and who is the ultimate decision maker when there's conflicting views here and also the role of the MDT um, when do we get to the point of needing an MDT I think that the pandemic shown us that we can really quickly and easily get together via teams Sam Alton was um, speaking earlier now they wanted an MDT and I think we managed it within 24 hours you know there isn't the logistics of having to travel and find a room etc we can be readily available to make more swifter safety um, approaches so watch the policies that come in your way which will hopefully back you up when you have um, a pressure from the acute saying we need to discharge a patient who has said they will give up smoking or when you have from you know a consultant saying I want to put oxygen back into this high risk patient where you've previously removed it a policy will give clarity to to everybody including us but I mentioned at the beginning I was going to see what exactly we could do here so BOC are we're campaigning for smoking cessation so our technicians are always in that prime position face to face with the patients so what we have started to do is engage with all smoking services all smoking cessation services locally um, to get the training on board so that our technicians can give that very brief advice on smoking cessation um, they'll have that conversation and then they can signpost patients for you know further support and options and i'd like to see further down the line what's the effect of this i'd like to audit have we had an impact with patients going through smoking cessation? I'd like to know that those services can also pick our patients up quickly um, and monitor them and show their outcome as well, almost like KPIs really. Um, but I just want to bring in uh, James Phillips here to feedback on the technician side of training that's taken place so far. So James, what would you like to add here? Morning all. Um, so this came from the time when I was a HT myself, so a technician on the roads. And we'd go through, um, you know, smoke and safety policy with our patients, you know, what to do, what not to do. But when it comes to the bit of um, stopping smoking, on our information we we give out, it's just a, a telephone number and a website, which that's when the conversation ended. So I approached One Life Suffolk to arrange training with the uh, HTs. Um, we've had some training done at Norwich last week and we monitor the engagement and smoking engagement with the, the patients gone up at that branch. So it's really positive. Yeah, so um, we take it seriously our side as well. And I think that this is all about healthy life, healthy living and and, um, you know, making a, an action if there's that poor behaviour going on. It's kind of trying to do something positive there and then. And you'd be amazed what uh, patients will disclose to the technician that they may see weekly, um, that they may not dis uh, disclose to their GP. So we're just trying to make it as an every contact count uh, initiative um, and we'll review the outcomes. And maybe we might have something that we could share in September, October um, at our webinars that we'll deliver then. So brilliant news that the policies are coming, they are arriving for the region and as clinicians you can feel less caught in a between a rock and a hard place or trying to do the best by a patient, the policy should back that up. I also think the policy, all of them should be reviewed after a year to, to make sure they're fit for purpose or we could learn from the first year's rollout to see what adjustments or tweaks we need to make to them. 
Okay, any questions on the smoking uh, cessation policies that are being rolled out or anything that BOC are doing at the moment? Now you take a while to warm up, don't you? But we're behind time. What you can do if you want to is submit questions into the box and I can answer them separately or contact you afterwards. Um, I'm hoping you're all aware of these policies taking place and coming your way. Um, and I hope you're all smiling, thinking, yeah, it's going to help us. Less headaches. Um, the policy includes uh, carbon monoxide testing. Now, I haven't seen um, the policies, any of the policies yet. I don't know if Janice is on the line to see if she put it in hers. I think there is a role for it. Um, there is a cost implication for it. And also some areas can tap into their local smoking cessation service to borrow these carbon monoxide testing kits so they can check patients. I've also questioned internally, is there any role for our technicians to be able to do this? Is there any value in BOC taking this on or is it, should it still be held with you guys clinically? So that one's open for discussion. Um, and then we've got another question. What are the options for current smokers having home oxygen? Well, it's very interesting. So on the whole, I think for most people on this call, we would avoid putting oxygen in if a patient is continuing to smoke. But if you are sitting in a hospital where you've got pressure on your beds and you know that patient needs oxygen still, there has been there is an ongoing tendency to prescribe oxygen and discharge the patient. And then the community team have to try and either wean off post exacerbation or manage this risk, this higher risk um, situation. So sadly, the, the oxygen is still going into smoking patients. And as clinicians, I think everyone has been waiting for a policy that they could stand beside to say, actually, you're not getting it right now until you've engaged with smoking cessation services. Will these be available to all prescribers? I work in London. If you're from London community, if you're from Maria Buxton's team, absolutely. If you're um, not in um, the BOC catchment area, I think London is is different and I'm not aware of their appetite to get the policies out. Um, I'd suggest to you that you take it to your CCGs to start saying what are we doing about it? Help to create it as well. So there's no no reason why this couldn't be a nationwide approach. Yeah. OK, mindful of time and I've still been a little bit behind here, um, but it's really good healthy discussion. I'd like to hand over to James Phillips to present awareness and safety training on e-cigarettes and the dangers for our home oxygen patients. Over to you, James. Thank you, Claire. OK, can you see the screen, everybody? Yeah. OK, yeah. so I'm just going to run through this training on e-cigarettes, um, hopefully to give you an understanding of you know, how they work and, you know, the dangers associated with them when it comes to um, using them with oxygen. Um, you know, currently fires caused by e-cigarettes are, are far lower than cigarettes. So, you know, um, there's a lot of people moving from cigarettes or e-cigarettes. And myself, I used to be a smoker four years ago and um, started using e-cigarettes and haven't smoked a cigarette since. Um, so they had worked for me. So there's an estimated 2.9 million adults in Great Britain currently using e-cigarettes and one and a half million of these are, are former smokers. Um, they carry a fraction of the risks um, associated with cigarettes when combined with, um, you know, smoking sensation um, supports, but they do still carry a risk. And I think in the past, we always looked at smokers and didn't know too much about e-cigarettes and, you know, didn't know the dangers that they could cause. And it was around three years ago when I was a, a technician on the roads, I attended a patient's property where she'd had an e-cigarette in her lap and fallen asleep. Um, she had her oxygen on and when she woke up, the oxygen had saturated and got into the e-cigarette. She brought it up to her face to, to use it, to press the button and it exploded, causing really severe burns. Um, she threw the unit on the floor and it set fire to the carpet as well, which she, she put out with her hands, which again, cause some issues. So that's where we sort of picked up on on this this part. 
So e-liquids, so these are the, the bottles you see at garages, normally 10 milliliters. So they contain propylene glycol, which is a liquid alcohol, which is in solvents, antifreeze, foods and plastics, perfumes also, and vegetable glycerine, um, which is a natural product made from vegetable oil, um, from rapeseed, palm oil or coconut oil. Um, nicotine, we all know what nicotine does, but with e-cigarettes, um, when you buy the, the bottles of the liquids, they come in different nicotine strengths. So they range from 24 milligrams of nicotine down to zero. So what most people do is start off high around about 18 milligrams, which I think is similar to a cigarette, and then wean themselves down to, to zero nicotine. So these are the types of e-cigarettes um, available at the moment. Um, the most common ones, if you look to the left, are the, the pen type. Um, these were the, the early versions, but a lot of people, when they try and quit smoke and find because they've got small batteries, do not produce enough power to give them the same sensation as smoking as cigarettes. So the most common one now is the one in the middle, so the black box, which is called a mod. So the reason they're called mods is because people can modify them so they can buy a separate body, um, separate coils, separate batteries and design one to suit them. But these are becoming increasingly powerful. And I'd say 90 percent of incidents around e-cigarettes are caused by these mods. So I'll just explain the parts of an e-cigarette. So this is a picture of a mod. So if we look at bottom left, this is the main unit where the battery sits in. Um, there's a screen on there so people can actually control the, the power they're putting through. So you've probably all seen it when somebody's used one of these and there's a huge cloud of smoke come out of the mouth. This is how they do it. So they can turn the power up to get, uh, you know, more draw from the, from the liquids. Up to the middle is the coil. So this is the part that basically vaporizes the liquids um, and then the patient inhales. So above that is the tank where the liquid sits and then the drip tip is the part they inhale from. So when somebody's using these, they you can see on the picture there, there's the blue button, which is the fire button. So it's held down, the coil then vaporizes the liquids and then the user moves it in. So inside the coil, so this is you know the part I wasn't aware of, um, and you know the ignition source. So inside the coil, you can see on the left hand side, the coil is the spring that's round, and the wick is a cotton type material that passes through the middle. So this then draws in the e-liquids. And if you look at the picture on the right, it shows you a picture of the coil being activated. So you can see there's two coils on this one glowing red hot. Some of the mods now can have six, seven or eight coils in them. So, you know, it's a huge amount of power there. Um, coil spits. So with the drip tip from the previous page, um, basically any foreign object like dust, dirt, food particles can drop into to the drip tip and go into the coil. So if this happens, um, you can have what's called coil spit. So when the user activates the button, whatever's in the coil can short circuit and cause a spit. So this is red hot liquid that can come out and you know burn lips and, and face and stuff like that. Um, as well with these mods, um, when it comes to cleaning, it's popular with some of these mod users because from the previous page with the wick and the coil, Overuse the, the e liquids have got flavours in. So you see them all like strawberry, banana, fruity, tutti, and there's like a, a sugar. So that builds up on the coils and the wick. So a lot of users find it easy just to take the tank off, hold the button down until it sets fire. So that will burn the old wick out and also clean the coil so they can then enter um, a new wick through those. So again, it's, it's a dangerous practice. So this is an example of. Um, some of the new mods coming out um, if you can see them and the power on them um, i think the original pens were probably about 10 watts these are up to 200 225 i know some are even higher now um, batteries and charges so a lot of problems come from the batteries and the charges because if you look online um, there's a lot of very cheap 
um, batteries which haven't got CE approvals and cheap charges as well. So the pat batteries can cause an issue if they're not looked after correctly or charged correctly either. And with the mods, um, people modify the wattage and reduce ohms, which builds up resistance, which can cause the batteries to overheat and explode as well. So this is um, pictures of somebody who's had um, an e-cigarette go off in their pockets. And this is really common because if somebody's wearing tight jeans or something like that, they can put the e-cigarette in and the fire button can be pressed, obviously, whilst they're bending over or doing something. That's what's happened in this case. So the fire button's been activated. It's overheated and exploded. Um, so obviously, put his hand into the pockets. So burns on the left. And this is um, a picture of the, the leg on the right. And here's a picture of the batteries that have failed afterwards. So they can be a successful tool in giving up smoking, but basically, you know, the same rules must apply to e-cigarettes as they do normal cigarettes. So never use an e-cigarette or let others use them in the same room or use an oxygen. Um, ventilate clothing um, for at least 20 minutes um, after vaping before you are uh, sorry, after being on the oxygen before you use the vape and um, never use e-cigarettes within three metres of oxygen equipment. Okay, thank you for your attention. Um, if anyone's got any questions, please ask. No. Okay, if there's no questions, I mean, you can put them in the chat as we go along. I've just answered a couple as well. So, James, keep an eye out. Uh, share the slides, powerful. Um, yes, I mean, the. so this is recorded and it will be on the portal as well. If there's anything bespoke you need from uh, James's slides, um, I'm sure we can sort something out for you as well. Is that okay? We can, and thank you for your comments. Thank you. OK, we now want to. There's, we're now, Claire, Claire, there's yeah. just one there that we've possibly got time to answer about. Ooh, yeah. What's, what temperature do they heat up to, Jim? I don't know the exact temperature, but you can actually with the coil, if you hold it to a piece of paper or cloth, it will set fire. So it's yeah, very hot. Mm. I can find out. Very interesting. OK, now moving on to um, our last speakers of this morning's webinar. So I'd like to introduce Paul and Kieran, and they're going to talk about the collaboration between the Home Auction Service and the Fire Rescue Services. So over to you both. Hi, Claire. Thanks uh, for inviting us along to this uh, meeting. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, if I click take control at the top of my screen, will that give me control? Of the yeah, slide? it yeah. will. You've got the power. Excellent. How exciting. OK, uh, it's just doing some kind of loading, but that's OK. Um, OK, so hopefully if I click that, that will change the slide. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, brilliant. OK, so myself and Paul uh, are going to just take you through, uh, first of all, a little bit about us at Essex Fire and what our kind of priorities and uh, aims are from a prevention perspective. Um, then we'll talk to you a little bit about our understanding of the risk of fire and how that changes uh, so kind of trends and things like that. And then uh, a little bit about our sort of safe and well offer, so home safety offer, uh, before finishing on um, how we work with BOC already and how that helps us to kind of manage risk in Essex. Um, we're not dissimilar or unique to other fire and rescue services across the country. So if you don't live in Essex, that's a shame for you. But uh, I promise you other fire and rescue services are doing very similar uh, things to us. Um, and I think what we'll do is just start with some of the kind of um, uh, the stats. Um, so I don't know if they're going to appear in order because I can see everything in, without animations on my screen. So hopefully you can see all of that. But essentially last year in Essex, there were 875 uh, fires in the home uh, and two preventable fatalities. That was a good year for us from a fatality perspective. Uh, numbers wise, obviously no no year with fatalities in it is a good year, but um, we've already had double that this year uh, and about 65 uh, injuries. And obviously this only includes the things that are reported to us. Um, we tried to get some data around uh, what percentage of those included oxygen, but uh, I'll share that after uh, today's meeting. Um, we've had some time to crunch that. 
but so these are only things that get reported to us. So for example, that uh, a case study earlier in, in relation to uh, the gentleman who had a fire that was reported after the event. Sometimes those things are reported after the event, sometimes they're not. Um, and if we, we look at, we use a, a model called the Manchester New Economy model to apply a cost to incidents. And for Essex, that comes out at approximately 38 million. And that doesn't include fatalities. But that takes into account all of the destruction, insurances, public response, uh, hospitalisation, etc. that goes with uh, the cost of fire. So uh, that's the kind of, uh, that's a snapshot of the incidents in Essex. Um, we have some goals as a fire and rescue service that we, from a prevention perspective, that we want to achieve. And that's why we work with people like uh, yourselves and BOC in order to uh, reduce ADF is our acronym, it stands for a uh, Accidental Dwelling Fire. So any uh, uh, fire that occurs in the home was unintentional, which is most of them. Um, we want to reduce injury and reduce death as a consequence of those things. And ultimately as well, also reduce costs to the uh, to the to the um, public purse in terms of dealing with those things. Primarily, it's about the reduction of ADF injury uh, and death. We have a pretty simple plan to achieve that, um, and that is essentially that we want to find as many people at risk of fire as possible and engage them in quality person-centered fire prevention activity. And that sounds when you put it on a on a screen as three lines of text, it sounds really simple. But actually, that's where working with partners to really understand where people who are at increased risk of fire are living, uh, where we can find them, uh, and then finding ways to engage with them in some really kind of meaningful um, prevention activity that Paul will talk about shortly um, is is central to how we intend to kind of keep uh, ADF down in Essex. Um, and that's kind of that we do that through referrals into our services through uh, people like BIC, uh, health professionals in the community, third sector, uh, all kinds of, of routes in. So what do we know about the risk of fire? It's all very well saying because that's the plan. Um, are we just going to talk through a little bit about how we actually kind of complete our um, assessment of risk so that you understand our thinking? When we're looking at risk of fire, we're really looking at uh, identifying the risk of two things happening. So firstly, a fire starting um, and there and secondly, of an individual being injured or uh, dying as a consequence of fire in the home. Um, so we're looking for to prevent the, the fire starting in the first place and then uh, anything we can do to prevent the person being injured. And we do that by looking at uh, two areas, the person and the place. Um, when it comes to the person, we, we, we're we looking at their well-being, so uh, their health, uh, how they are as an individual, uh, and also their behaviour, so how they live their life, how they occupy that space and kind of what behaviours um, we can see and whether those things increase the risk of fire or indeed increase the risk of an individual being uh, injured in one. Those two things blur, and as you'll see in a moment, but it's just a helpful way of us thinking through the risk. And then the place, uh, and this relates to the kind of space the individual lives in so um and you can imagine we see thousands of people every year uh, in all kinds of living conditions um with all kinds of risks associated with it so if we just look at that in terms of some of the risk factors you might uh experience or see as part of that um things that we might uh look for under well-being challenges with mobility that might impair escape um cognitive impairment like dementia so and dementia is an increasing uh, challenge for us, the fire and rescue service from individuals kind of uh, doing things like uh, forgetting the cooking or or uh, put it, putting plastic kettles on hobs thing, all the kinds of things that you'd associate with um, dementia uh, to things like resident uh, family members uh, locking individuals into homes in order to mitigate the risk of them kind of wandering off uh, in the day or at night which therefore presents us with a with a fire risk if they can't uh, vacate the property in an emergency. So uh, lots of things around wellbeing, uh, including also short and long term health conditions. When it comes to behaviours, we're looking at things like smoking, and this is where lots of uh, collaborative opportunity with BOC uh, and health comes in. So uh, smoking, um, particularly on oxygen or with, when using oxygen, but also uh, we come across still um, 
uh, instances where individuals smoke in bed and they're using things like um, emollient creams uh, or they're, and they're restricted to bed um, drinking uh, to th things that are perhaps less obvious, like um, not closing internal doors at night. So uh, just by closing an internal doors in your property can prevent fire spread uh, as quickly as, as when you leave them open. So uh, a door by you about 15, 20 minutes in a fire and that gives uh, uh, the service time to turn up and um, hopefully uh, put it out for you. Um, and some really obvious ones like unsafe cooking practices. And then things in the place, so risk factors in terms of place and space people live in, all kinds of things here from clutter and hoarding, which increases fire load. So it means that uh, fire can spread more quickly. There's more, more uh, fuel for it to, to burn and therefore provides a, a more serious or quick burning fire. Um, and th th if we understand that to be holding a property, we'll ensure that we record that on a mobilising system and respond with a third appliance uh, every time to things like lack of working or appropriate smoke detection. So particularly if important if you've got like a sensory impairment and require uh, a different kind of smoke detection. So hopefully that's kind of clear person both their well-being and their behaviour and place and that's how we look at it. So health and well-being is really central to our understanding of an assessment of the risk of fire. Um, so just to put that into some context, I think if I, I sort of think we'd originally um, looked at this in terms of uh, it flashing up with, with kind of animations, but it, it's all on the screen at once, that's okay. It might look a bit busy, but come with me on it. Um, so what you can see here is, is just us illustrating an individual's life. Uh, from birth to, to um, death at the end there. It's not an unhappy life, I promise you. They've had a, 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 this particular person has a great life. Um, the axis on, on the, uh, the horizontal one is their age, that runs down to 100. And the vertical axis is, um, bottom of that is high risk and the, and the top is low risk. So there's a dotted red line that cuts through the middle. And that is, we're, we're surmising an acceptable level of risk of fire. So it's kind of a neutral ground. Anything above that is a decrease in risk and anything below the red line is an, is an um, increase in risk that we'd want to do something about. So for this kind of illustration, we'll call the, the uh, we'll call them Bob. Uh, when they're, you can see there they're born into a loving family and therefore the risk of fire uh, decreases. And then they go to school and they spend less time in the property, so they spend less time at home. And what that means is they're spending less time in a place that is potentially uh, dangerous or has an increased risk of fire. So again, they are uh, safer. Um, they get a bit older and they go to uni um, and everybody knows that uni, uh, you have a great time. I don't know uh, if you've ever been to uni and come back and uh, been hungry after a night out and put the bacon on the, under the grill and then forgotten about it. This happens surprisingly often uh, in Essex. Um, so there's a decrease there, therefore in uh, safety in terms of fire, so an increased risk of fire. Um, there might be a little in intervention there uh, where the, a fire safety officer speaks to them in a lecture theatre. Maybe that slightly increases the, their uh, awareness and therefore safety, but broadly it doesn't change. And then they get a job and they uh, start to grow up a little bit and they have some, some kids maybe. Uh, and the act of giving somebody a small delicate bundle to look after uh, means that all of a sudden fire safety uh, goes slightly up in the uh, priority order. Uh, and they grow and learn and um, uh, and therefore just become more comfortable and aware of safety. At some point in their life, they uh, might their health might start to deteriorate uh, with age. This could be, uh, as we've sort of discussed today, developing some respiratory condition and requires oxygen therapy, and that will increase their risk of fire. And as they uh, age and uh, health deteriorates, that will continue to to uh, happen. At some point they might access care at home and some uh, assistive equipment or technology which might uh, mitigate the risk, uh, but ultimately you can see here uh, the action taken to really uh, mitigate the risk is that they end up in residential care where they are all sorts of all sorts of reasons they are much safer um, from a fire perspective. The point of this really is to illustrate the fact that your risk of fire and, and changes I, I, throughout life and lots of things will, will push you below that line in terms of increasing risk of fire. So what we try and do as a, as a fire and rescue service is make sure we're in a position where we can influence that 
um, at the right time in the right place in the right way. So some of those red circles, which would have gloriously appeared at this point uh, along the line, illustrate um, moments we already may try to engage with individuals. So you can see there around the school age, we speak we speak to hundreds of thousands of young people every year uh, in relation to uh, fire safety. Uh, we try and engage with students uh, because we understand there to be risk there. We try and engage with people at key moments in their life, but also we try and make services like safe and well um, available at the point when people start to deteriorate or start to uh, understand uh, health, increasing health challenges and engage with other services such as um, oxygen supplies, such as uh, advice and guidance and support with things like dementia or CAPD. So just an illustration of how, of how that works, really. I'm going to hand over to Paul now, hopefully. Thanks, Kieran. If you can still control the slides for me, though, yeah. please. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. I'll be as brief as I possibly can because I'm very, very aware of the time restraint that we've got now. So our home fire safety service, um, people can refer into that and they refer into that through our home information team. And there's various ways they can do that. They can do it either by Microsoft form, uh, by email or actually uh, a telephone conversation. We prefer the Microsoft form because it captures all the information we need. Once we've got the information, we then triage that. And as you can see on the screen, we have three uh, methods. We have the bronze method, which is really something that's a, a very low risk and not immediate. And that will go out through our uh, volunteers and our firefighters to attend the properties. We then come into the silver and gold um, where there's a medium risk around silver, which would a uh, safe and will visit with benefit. Um, but within the gold, that's more of a high risk. So that might require us as safe and well to go into to assess so that we can actually triage that then onto our community builders who provide a more bespoke approach um, and deal with more complex, multi-layered, uh, much as the discussion we've had today from, from the case study. Um, this then feeds into the CFRMIS system, and this is a system now used by 36 different fire and rescue services across the country. And what it does is it allows us to hold the information, record it, and we can use it for reporting but it's a really good way of um, developing uh, uh, an overview of, of what the safe mill officers are going to go into and what the expectations so they can prepare themselves considering some of the stuff that they can deliver within that visit. In the COVID environment, you know, we were very consciously aware there are still people out there uh, of significant risk. So we needed to make sure that we could engage them. We had a team of five managers within the organisation and we held a, a gold crisis meeting weekly where we assessed the need to, to go out and absolutely uh, still provide a, a service to support those more vulnerable and at risk. And within the period between September of 20 up to March of this year, we had 490 cases that we reviewed and we were able to go out and complete 80% of them to make sure that people were still able to access our services and we were able to provide uh, the service that we're there for to protect them from, from, from risk. Um, within the safe and well visit itself, we cover a range of uh, things as well as fire and safety. Um, we speak about uh, dementia, social isolation, fuel poverty, slips, trips and falls, restricted to bed and, and confined to property as well around mobility, uh, smoking cessation, alcohol abuse, fraud, scams, crime prevention, carbon monoxide and sensory loss. Um, our, all of our officers are sensory champions, part of the sensory champion network across Essex. And what this means is they have more of an understanding around the barriers and around how to access and provide um, the right advice and support with the right equipment. Um, it's, it's, in Essex, we have a high prevalence of people with sensory loss um, because of the ageing population. We're slightly over that for the national average as well. So it's a really important element to make sure that our um, safe and well officers were equipped and confident in their ability to engage with people of Essex. Um, we are also very strong around our dementia environment as well. All of our officers are dementia friends and they've received additional training to have that lived experience of dementia. Um, and we did that through a company up in Earls Colm so they could really understand the effects of what it felt like to, to, to have dementia and then be able to, to mitigate and reduce some of the information we're giving. So it was done in a, in a very empathetic and understandable way for that person uh, with the effects of dementia. We fit different types of smoke alarms. So we do the standard smoke alarm, but we also do the sensory. Um, that sensory alarm system is sort of the entry into uh, perhaps hearing loss or, or other conditions that require them to be alerted to the alarm being uh, activated. When I say the entry level, 
we are connected in our partnerships with other organisations and other commission services within Essex that can provide more bespoke equipment. So if someone does have profound hearing loss, we can then refer into that organisation as well to ensure the person gets not only the adequate smoke alarm and carbon monoxide protection, but also supports their environment uh, with regards to the doorbell activity or perhaps a text phone. Um, while we're there, as I say, we can refer through to many different organisations and we're also trusted assessors, so we can fit equipment as well in some areas. And we work uh, across the, uh, uh, the county with the care line providers as well. Can you do the next one for me, please, Kieran? That one. OK, um, go on to the next one for me, thanks. So the way we work with BOC is it says on the slide there that gives you an overview of what we actually currently do. The importance of it is twofold for us, really. Within our response mechanism, we need to have an understanding if there's a significant risk at properties when we are going to attend them. So this is fed through to our MDT system onto our, our crews, and it's an annotation that's put onto the address that advises them there is a risk of uh, oxygen or oxygen equipment being held at the property. So it gives them the opportunity to plan accordingly as they approach the incident. We did, um, uh, or we still do, sorry, we meet quarterly regionally with other fire and rescue services and BOC are part of that um, meeting with us. But myself and James through conversations identified that because there was a significant risk uh, around home oxygen, um, that the, the gap or the space that was provided in that regional meeting of about 10 minutes on the agenda wasn't really appropriate for us to consider that specifically and quite selfishly for Essex, you know, so we've now developed a monthly meeting and we're coming up for our third one, I think, this this Friday. And what that does, it gives us a space so that we can really significantly look at with closer observation to support early intervention and also identify mutually beneficial uh, opportunities for us. So the purpose around it is risk of, uh, awareness, early intervention, mutual support and development, and also strengthening of the partnership. Because what that will do, that will provide us tangible outcomes that will support not only the home oxygen users, but also the home oxygen environment in Essex. So within those meetings, we discuss things such as series. We also discuss things such as SARES, which are serious and uh, after incident responses from the fire service. So we can really cast um, the knowledge and the perception so we can understand how we both approach things and how we use that learning experience to provide mitigation and possible change in processes further on down the line. Um, in that meeting space, we get updates from each organisations. We, we, we share opportunities of joint training. Um, an example of that, uh, recently we were talking about cuckooing and where BIC uh, technicians are seeing more and more around this space. So we're able and capable through our partnership working with Essex Police to provide a space of where we can go and give some awareness and some training around cuckooing for BIC staff. We share risk assessments. We share a lot of different information so that we really do have an understanding of the risks and key changes that potentially are barriers already, uh, emerging barriers and risks that could be on the horizon for us. And for us as a fire and rescue service, we deeply immerse ourselves in with a lot of different organisations. An example of that would be the intelligent data we're currently doing around community asset mapping. This has uncovered uh, so many um, incidences for us of early intervention. Uh, an example of that was around food poverty for uh, families that are available to access the uh, children's lunch scheme. High prevalence of that. Now, although these people are on our radar at the moment, they absolutely will be. And unfortunately, that will be a crisis. So we've recognised the trend. We, we recognise the shift. It gives us early intelligence to be able to go in and have those intervention opportunities. But within those intervention opportunities in sort of the BOC environment, what it does, it allows us to have um, information and uh, access to engagement opportunities. We do something called Safe, Well and Secure. It's a multi-agency approach that focuses on a particular area where we heat map information and it gives us really specific targets to go in and to look at those communities um, to provide from the partner organisations um, key performance indicators so we can meet them, but discover really where the, these breakdowns in sort of those that are disconnected. And that might be through situation or it might be through choice, an opportunity to go and discuss. And then from that data that we get back from all these different engagement opportunities, we can help feed that, feed that into BOC so we have a greater understanding of where risk sits, how it emerges, and it also might be an early intervention for BOC, recognising an opportunity to go in and be part of that um, 
approach to ensure that people are absolutely informed. We've been talking about smoking cessation today and e-cigarettes. You know, I see that as a really useful piece of tool. So if we're heat mapping and we're going into an area where there's a high prevalence of, of smoking, BOC could be part of that engagement because they will be considered to be informed, professional, and it might raise early intervention opportunities and behavioural change in the activity we're doing so that the people aren't coming to us at crisis, much as the, the case studies that we've seen today. Um, I'm aware of the time, it's 24 minutes past. That's the end of my my bit um, for you all. I thank you all. Uh, if there's any questions, I'm sure Kieran will be able to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there are some questions um, that have been put into the chat. Uh, Kieran, I don't know if you can see them. I think the first question that came up was from Leanne. Now, Leanne would be in the Essex region, and she had a question about what advice can they give? Or what can they do when a patient is housebound and on oxygen? Um, just sorry. What can we... it, it was more around when a pa when you're doing the risk assessment and a patient says they're unable to leave the house unaided and they live alone. What should we be do should we be putting anything in place? Um, you know, what kind of support and advice should we be offering for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. From it's that it's the really boring answer which is that um it's all about the it's all about the risk isn't it so it's, it's about a risk as individual um person-centered risk assessment so what we would w in, at any point would like to sort of see and talk to an individual in that kind of situation if they'd let us and have a chat and assess their property and them and the way that they uh, live within it but we'd be looking for things that might increase the risk of fire so if it's an individual that uh really yeah okay they're they're restricted to bed and uh but they're not smoking and they don't really do anything that um fundamentally increases their risk of fire and the house is in good nick then really there's not a great um deal more you can do it because actually they're, they're probably going to be safer living at home and accessing care or whatever it is however it is they're living their life um what we would always look to do though is the bare minimum in terms of making sure they've absolutely got the right smoke detection fitted so we can fit some kind of um <clears throat> smoke detection throughout the property make sure there's enough on each floor and any higher risk areas in the in the house you might want to consider a care line and some kind of um uh sort of smoke detection that that runs through to a, an, a receiving center um for a quick response in the event of an emergency and we'd advise that in that kind of a scenario and also if they are restricted if they're really struggling with their mobility restricted to bed or chair you, we can actually put an annotation on our mobilising system. And this is um, the same kind of process we'd follow with uh, BOC in terms of oxygen. So the more information we have about the risk at a property, the better able we are to respond to that in advance of um, firefighters arriving there. So if we, for example, if we're aware that somebody is restricted to bed uh, and it's, that's marked as an annotation on our uh, mobilising system, we're able to uh, feed that through to our firefighters on the way to an incident. So they're prepared and they know that there's somebody in this property, person's reported, who's unable to get out on their own. So they're aware of that before they rock up. But um, I, I think, you know, it, it's all about proportionate risk assessment and we're more than happy to to assist with that. Okay. Just, to, just, sorry, just to add on to that as well, Leanne, that the visit is a very holistic person-centred approach. So it really does recognise some of the potential barriers that might be there for that individual. Uh, and there can be different uh, suggestions and things put in place regarding how they protect themselves in the event of a fire. So, um, yeah, our advice, as Kieran said, would be absolutely we need to have a conversation with those people and we would really welcome referrals into the service so that we can have that opportunity to discuss because it will lead on to other opportunities, as Kieran said, of where we can do our absolute most to make sure that we've reduced and mitigated uh, risk and the, the risk of serious harm to them in the event of a, a, an unfortunate fire occurring. I think you're going to be flooded with yeah. referrals now for sure. Um, but there are lots of questions about other areas. I don't know, James Phillips, whether this is something you want to answer. You know, Bedfordshire, Norfolk, what are our links then? So we've got excellence for Essex. What's happening elsewhere? Yeah, so we've got, because I think people are asking for lists of names and numbers. So, you know, we don't have the meetings like we do with Essex, but we keep in contact with the fire services. So if we have a series, say, in Norfolk, we've had a couple of incidences there. So we've got contact numbers for who we speak to, run through the Siri and look at the best way forward. So we can provide you with a, a list of numbers as well and email addresses for your local fire service. 
So is the best position at the moment for, for clinicians to go through us, James, to then signpost to the correct officer in the fire service? I think so. Um, you know, okay. if it's raised, you know, uh, install, then, you know, regardless if it's my team or Eastmeet or whatever, then they'll signpost it to the fire service and run through the information with them. We, we, it's worth saying as well, if you, if you get really stuck and you don't have a contact, just give our, we have a home safety information team and they kind of field all of our referrals and things that come in and triage the bookings. Um, and they're a bit like a call centre. So if you want to give us a call, drop us an email, we can point you to our opposite numbers in any fire and rescue service. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, lots and lots of positive feedback for your talk. So thank you, chaps. Now it's half past ten. Um, that that's us really. So I just want to really to to look at a conclusion and coming soon for all of us. Hopefully, there's going to be improved safety for our patients, less unhealthy behaviour with smoking, uh, meaning meaning that we've got improved health with all of our patients. There's going to be that regional approach with our smoking cessation policies, greater benefit of even having oxygen therapy, and then it will be fewer series as well. So I think, um, I hope that you agree our learning obje objectives have been achieved on um, understanding policy into practice and the importance of it. Um, any further information I will share with you September, October. I know that people want to know details, dates, etc. I think we've shared a good bit of safety information um, and highlighted how safety is paramount and and really importantly is that collaborative working, the fire service, the GPs, lots of talk about MDTs. Um, it's just it's for the greater good of, of us um, and the patient as well. So I hope that you've enjoyed today. Thank you for your attention. This recording will go, as I said, on the portal. If there's any future suggestions for September, October, we will have something like on COVID practice sharing, but anything else that you'd like to hear, guest speakers, etc., then please let us know because we are starting to plan already for that. So like I say, uh, September, October will be webinars and hopefully next year we'll return to face to face so we can do some good networking as well. So thank you so much for our guest speakers, the panel and everybody who's joined the meeting today. Have a really good Thursday bank holiday weekend for those that are off. So thank you. Thanks Claire. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was excellent. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thanks very much.